Sorry, too soon. <laughs> okay. Uh, call them uh, Committee of the Whole, Monday, Ju June 12th, 2017, meeting to order. Um, my name is Rich Marks. I, along with Alderman Cummings, are the Alderman for the Second Ward. Uh, we have had a request to kind of flip tonight the agenda a little bit, unless anyone objects to it, to flip new business to the beginning, because there are a few people here who do want to talk and um, have to run out to another meeting. Does anyone have any? I have a motion by Alderman Kilberg, a second. Second by Alderman Swanson. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, meeting is flipped. We will start by covering then the new business and I know sir I'm sorry I didn't get your name Matt Henry, Matt Henry. Okay. Uh, name and address when you sure. come forward uh, please my name is Matthew Henry I live at 226 Charles Street in Geneva Illinois I've been a Geneva resident for over 20 years um, I wanted to bring to attention to the board a matter that we've talked to both Tara and Mike Bruno about um, concerning the building of a new house um, in our neighborhood um, directly across the street or catty corner to me was a house um, that was on about an acre lot. It's now 303 Charles Street. It was previously 301, I believe, Charles Street. They, it was a one-story ranch house on, again, about an acre lot, was sold off, and this is what they are in the process of building. Um, Eagle Brook, don't take that personally if you're the alderman for that, has come to our neighborhood. My neighborhood is I'm, I'm two blocks from the high school. Um, most of our uh, houses are mid-century modern ranches. Um, we love the neighborhood. There's been a couple of houses that have been built, but when they've been built, the big difference is that they've been built to street grade. And if you take a look at this, and it doesn't quite do the justice, but frankly, from the street right here to where the first floor is, or first story is, is about five feet. This building towers over our street. We called this to the attention of the city. We met with several of them, including our aldermen, at, at uh, a couple of points in front of the structure. Um, we are baffled, as are many of the builders that come by and take a look at this, at how this structure could be even code. I will tell you that seven years ago, I was replacing the sidewalk in the front of my house when I lived at 709 Maple Lane, just literally pulling out bricks, putting new bricks in. That was stopped by one of your code enforcement people. He had a cease and desist order. He slapped on my door, made me pay a $75 fee, which is incorrect, because I wasn't altering anything at all, just replacing brick for brick. And I had to go through that for 75 bucks, and yet this monstrosity has been built in our neighborhood with absolutely nobody taking a look at it and saying this is not right. All we hear is it's to code, it's to code, it's to code. The kicker is, is this, is since this was built and our biggest concern has been that we would see water in our basement. Since it's been built, our neighbor directly across the street from us had three feet of water in her basement. Two feet on one corner, three feet in the other. She's been there for 17 years, never had a drip of water. It came up through the sewer drain. This gentleman is gonna build two houses, one here, one here. This is Tom Rogers' house right here. He's building two 3,600 square foot houses where there used to be about a 2,000 square foot ranch. It can't not cause water problems. We've heard that, well, the sewer system is bad to begin with, there's some issues there, we need to go through and put new sewer drains down. I don't care, if that's the case, this clearly should have never been built. You can see from my house how much higher it is than the street level. You can see, again, from the center of the street how much high it rises. We talked to the builder and he said, well, what we're allowed to do is build to an equal um, elevation as the rest of the block. Well, even if that's the case, he's still about a foot, a foot higher than the rest of the block. Again, we hear from the city, well, the issue is that he had to build no, no taller than 35 feet above where the street was. Well, he's well under that. Well, I don't care. Irrespective of that, it's still causing issues within my neighbor's houses and hopefully not in mine, but I'm sure that that's coming up. So here's what we've got. We've asked, again, our aldermen, and they've been very kind to work on our behalf for it. We've said, what is the issue with the grading? And, and you know, Mike, I appreciate it, but I, I still can't sort this out. Geneva modified its ordinance some years ago to help mitigate the problems of teardown and infill development in established neighborhoods. 
These are stricter than most communities. Building height is measured by establishing a reference point by averaging the elevation at the four corners of the lot. This is different than what the city told me and different than what the builder said, by the way, just as an FYI. Um, artificially raising the grade means that the building cannot be built as high or tall as it could be if the grade were left unaltered. Everything has, was found to be in compliance with code. There we go. There will be a final inspection of the grading as well. So the inspection takes place after this monstrosity is built. That's really pretzel logic. Why you would go and inspect this thing post de facto, expect them to tear down a $300,000 at cost structure, it's not going to happen. He's going to go ahead and sue the city and sue the lights out. This should have been done long beforehand. The plans for this house indicate the top of the foundation or start of the first floor living space is 756 feet above sea level. The grade at the lot line is 751 feet. The high point in the backyard, which existed when the older ranch house was there, is 754 feet above sea level. The final inspection that will be done on this house after electrical, plumbing, driveway, et cetera, will be the final grading plan to ensure the grading is actually what it's proposed. Again, that's great, but the horse is out of the barn and down the road. And we've got this thing being built and we've got basements flooding that had not flooded before. This could have been stopped. This should have been stopped. It wasn't stopped. People were more concerned about the maple tree that got taken down in place of this house than they were about this thing being built. And I can tell you, when I called the city and got transferred to six different departments today to find out what the ordinance are for grading, guess what? We don't really have any ordinances for grading. Really? No, our ordinance has to do with building height. Well, again, None of that helps the situation. The only ordinance that there is related to grading is related to the driveway. And again, you can see what a huge issue the driveway is going to be that, again, floods right into the neighbors next to it. And that says, the grade of the driveway shall not vary from a minimum of 2% to a maximum of 6% from the top of the curb to the center line of the existing street unless existing topography of the adjacent ground requires a steeper slope to ensure access. So in other words, it has to fit in these parameters unless it doesn't. Again, it doesn't help out the situation. So what I would say is this, is clearly this is, I think this is house is sold. It's done, it's complete. He's gonna build another one in there. He's gonna alter our neighborhood, alter the personnel of our neighborhood, walk away with 600 grand in his pocket between the two houses, and this is what we're stuck with. Anyhow, when you look at these ordinances, I ask that in the future that the aldermen be proactive when it's brought up to their attention, not hide behind to code to code, but really take a look at the codes, look further, explain it more in, in depth so we can understand it, but also stop so this building like this doesn't continue throughout the neighborhoods of Geneva and alter our town. We don't need Eagle Brook. We don't need Mill Creek. Those already exist. We need our neighborhood as it stands right now, that's what we wish to protect. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions for Alderman Bruno? Uh, well, yes, uh, Alderman uh, Burkhart and myself did spend a lot of time uh, out with this property. Uh, this, uh, this is the neighborhood, uh, Ford and Charles, a lot of people would be familiar with the, uh, uh, a lot of mid-century mid ranch homes, uh, lovely neighborhood. Um, I'm, I'm certainly uh, empathetic to uh, maintaining that type of character. Um, uh, but uh, to, you know, the, the code does allow what was built. I'm, I'm absolutely confident of that. Uh, and, we, and we do have a stricter, um, stricter ordinance for infill uh, uh, development. Um, uh, I'd offered, uh, and I guess anyone listening, if uh, the only way to truly preserve that character in the neighborhood is to uh, overlay some type of special zoning that would effectively cap everything at ranch homes. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the neighborhood wanted to do that, I'm, I'll, I'll be your champion. And that's, but that's, 
literally, as I said to you, secondary to the issue of flooding in the basements. Well, flooding look. in the basements. And I'm not talking about water seeping in through the window wells. I'm talking coming up from the drains in the basement, from the sewer system, because the sewer system is now taxed because of the green monster that's being built. Another one's going to be set up beside it. It can't not alter how that water is drained. I know what you said. We've met with several people from the city, went through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, it's an eyesore. It certainly is. It's too high. It certainly is. The grade is ridiculous. It certainly is. The very first thing we met with the city, our biggest concern, and I said this to one of the city people, I said it to Rich. I said, who do we see and who do we sue when our basements flood? He said, you contact the city. I said, this could have been changed long before it would come to that. That's where we are. And again, I, it's, it, every builder that goes by, I tell you, George Havlicek can't, Havlicek can't sneeze without the city asking what type of Kleenex he used. And yet this thing has been able to be built in our neighborhood with not one person going by. And, you know, Mike, I'm not taking it on you, please. But not without one person going by saying, you know what, this is just not right. The only thing we heard about is they took down that big, huge maple, which I love. I got two huge ones in my lot. But never once did they sit there and say, this thing is being built way too high. And that's what should have been done from the very beginning. And if not, then it's like... Scream, hold on, let's get these ordinances together because clearly there's a loophole that this builder who doesn't even live in Geneva, lives in Algonquin, is, is altering this neighborhood and altering this town, walking away with 600 grand in his pocket and literally leaving us with this in flooded basements. That is what we're dealing with and we expect the city government to at least support us, not just say it's to code. Well, which is why we, uh, we did develop the, uh, the infill ordinances which overlay much of uh, the old neighborhoods uh, again we are we are stricter now if uh, but when the when the driveway enforcement says two to six percent unless it doesn't I mean that doesn't help out whoever wrote these cords codes clearly omitted those that portion of it so here, here's what I'm asking moving forward okay where we are Let's get this thing buttoned up. Let's not allow this to get to, I don't want to be Wheaton. I don't want to be Glen Ellen. I don't want to be Naperville. You know, Kevin, the brand is Geneva. It's none of those. So let's, let's work on getting these codes. So this sort of stuff, they can't build five feet above street level anymore. They can't get away with it. You know, you can't flood your neighbor's basement. You can't come in from out of town, build the structure, get out of town, with all the money in your pocket and leave it for everybody else to deal with. It's not fair. It's not fair to you. It's certainly not fair to us residents, especially if the residents have to go through the process of suing the city to get it rectified. And then we have to go and spend all this money for the sewers. So anyhow, that's, that's all I have to say. And I appreciate you guys moving me ahead so I can at least talk to it. Yes. Uh, Alderman Cummings was first. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so my first question was, was going to be, it sounds like Microphone, please. Ideas on this. Uh, my first question was going to be specifically, mm -hmm. what would you like to see changed in the ordinance? I like I to see, yeah, this grading. Uh, again, if you take a look at it, the grade in itself, there's clearly a loophole in the fact that it doesn't even get addressed anywhere in our ordinances. Again, if you stand in the street in the corner, it is five feet, Don. It is this tall from the street to where that stoop is. Mm -hmm. And what you can't see here is this is a hole. This right here is new dirt that he just filled. And this is the existing driveway. This alone is about a foot and a half of new fill that he's in the process of bringing down to the street level. None of that is in any ordinances mm -hmm. anywhere. There's nothing. The only, again, the only thing that we thought is, hey, maybe because this driveway is at such a grade, that might be where it is. And then I read that one where, well, 2 to 6% less, you know, we can't do it. The way I would, I have a house that's, that's up high. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's at least, but it's a naturally occurring higher area. Right. So of course we have to have a steeper driveway. Mm -hmm. but, but I understand, I think, what you're saying is to, um, to grade something artificially and then build on that. Which is what he did. Be, there ought to be an he issue. He built it up. And, and the problem. gentleman, I'll tell you, the gentleman that, that, that dug the foundation, we went over and talked to him, he was digging it, and he said off the cuff, they got water issues. They got drain issues. All right, great. Well, I'm sure the city will handle it and take care of it. No. The other question I have is when a, when a builder comes in and proposes something, go in on a lot, do we, the city, um, not only approve the plans, but do we look at, at I don't know, about the diameter of the sanitary sewer pipes and the storm sewer pipes and say, you know, we can't handle it right now. Yes, you own the property. Yes, it's zoned residential. 
yes, we understand you want to build. No, you can't do it right now because you're going to, you're going to flood everyone in the periphery. Is there anything that stops a builder when we're absolutely aware that we have physical defects in handling the increased volume of water? I'm pretty sure George Havlicek had to build on or add on to the sewers because he had to dig those streets up. This gentleman hasn't done any of that. I don't know the answer. Yeah. We're going to have 7,200 square foot of houses between those two houses here. And again, that can't not alter the way that the water runoff takes, takes over. It can't. So anyhow. Alderman Ruby. Well, you kind of already answered this. I was wondering if you know why the builder created this grade and it sounds like he, he did it because he knew he was trying to avoid the water problems? Well, if you talk to him, he'll tell you nothing. Again, okay. he's, it's windward builder, it's out of Algonquin. I'm just talking about, we went over off the cuff and talked to the gentleman who was digging the foundation sure. at the time. And that's what he said to us. Okay. Um, so again, and I do know that the gentleman that owned the house before it did have some water issues in his basement. Okay. He did. Now, the house wasn't particularly well kept up. Um, you know, there was issues with it, but nonetheless, um, they knew that there was a there were problem with the drainage on the lot. Okay. And then my next question with the, um, with the drainage issues, is it, is it um, rainwater or sewage or both? It was rainwater. It was rainwater. Okay. So, and it's not sewage at all. So it's okay. clearly, clearly what has occurred is that the, the sewer, the rain water part of the sewer system so was the taxed. Sewers. Yes. Now okay. Mike came back and said that was the fifth largest rain we've had on history. Now I remember that rain back in 1996 that got 17 inches of rain in what was it 45 minutes. And I remember three and three years ago when we got the same thing within seven hours and we got a little bit of water in our basement. And we, we had not until that time. So I've, I've seen plenty of this just happening where we had successive rain over the course of three days, irrespective of whether or not there was a fifth largest rainfall on record. Nonetheless, the person across the street, you know, who is a wonderful neighbor, is a single mom trying to keep her house out of foreclosure with two kids in school. She had two feet of water in her basement. That's the last thing she needed sure. is to deal with two feet of water in her basement and nothing but, well, it's the code. I've been here for 17 years, never an issue with water. Well, it's the code. So clearly that wouldn't have flooded if, it, if the sewer system hadn't been maxed. Anybody else before I call on Alderman Bruno? Alderman McGaughan. Hi, Matt. Um, I'm just wondering if anyone from Public Works was called to maybe check the sewer lines um, leading from the neighbor's house that you mentioned who, who, had all, who experienced all that flooding. And, um, you know, I'm not the expert on, what, you know, rainwater runoff, but how do you know for sure that this new home, I know you're guessing, and it's obviously an educated guess, but how do you know for sure that um, there wasn't a problem with the homeowner's sump, you know, not she working have a properly? Sump. She's never had a sump. She's or, never had water in her basement. Or maybe, uh, you know, there could be some other reason. I don't think um, we should, like, you know, you can't, you, without you, doing like a, you Jeannie, know. you can. The, yeah. the house right across the street, two feet of water from mine. The one right across the street here, directly across from it, they just moved in. They had water. They had a plumber come out because they had water coming through. So it wasn't just one machine. person's home. No, no, home. no. Okay, no, I wasn't. I'm sorry. I it, wasn't sure. It was sure. also the Sarah okay, Scutal yeah. who lives right across the street. And then the new, co the young couple that lives directly across from the Rogers, they also had water in the basement. Again, new people. They hadn't been there before. Tom says, well, we've had some water in the past. I can't really tell you right now. I'm far enough away from it. Tom's biggest concern, I will talk for him because I've talked to him at length about this, is that they put another structure this same size on that lot, then Tom's going to have water in his basement. So can someone maybe, David, I know you're here this evening, explain why, you know, this new construction is causing all this flooding? Is it simply because of the, the grade, the increase of the grade? I would, I, that's again, I'm not, a, we've had a couple of gentlemen come by as well as a couple of builders go by and take a look at it. It has to do with the grade and the footprint. And again, I, I'm not convinced that we know beyond a shadow of doubt that this is what's caused the flooding. I think if, it's if possible. You, but. If you live in a house and nothing's ever changed and you've lived in that house for 17 to 20 years, okay, you've had plenty of rain before, all right, then something new takes place 
and you really feel and you know that the way that that place is being built and you understand just basic parameters of where water can run off and where it can't, and all of a sudden, nothing more than just a heavy two-day rain occurs, and all of a sudden you have two feet of water in your basement, your neighbor across the street also has water in their basement, and that neighbor also has and they never have before. No, I, I understand. I think yes. you, you misunderstood. What I'm asking is, I guess, you know, to prepare for the next mm -hmm. heavy rain events, um, you know, what can be done now that this right. home is here, well, and how can your neighbors kind said, of address that? You know, Mike can answer that. He said he put, what, a swale in front of it, if need be. Oh, I'll do what I can. You know, I'll, I'll put something there, and that's what we'll do. You know, I, I don't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. I can guarantee you. The guy's here. He's going to make a buck, and he's out of here. So he's not like George Havlicek that lives here in this town and has invested. He's not. He's invested in that property. It's an investment property here. He's gone. I don't care what happens with these neighbors. I can guarantee it. So I understand your point. All right. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but that's it. So thanks a lot, Alderman. I do really appreciate it. Thanks, Mayor Burns. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Is there any other new business since that's what we're actually on tonight? Okay, we will then move to the um, next item on the agenda, which is to approve the Committee of the Whole Minutes from May 22nd, 2017. So moved. Second. Motion. And seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Items of business now. Uh, item 3A, consider approval of special event application for Geneva Public Library Ice Cream Social on July 12th, 2017. So moved. Alderman Burkhart makes the motion. Second. Alderman Cummings makes the second. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, item 3B, consider approval of special event application for Festival of the Vine, September 8th through 10th, 2017. You so moved. moved. Motion by Alderman Bruno. Second. Second, second by Alderman Kilberg. Any questions, comments? Jean, do you have Okay. Alderman Bruno? Uh, Jean, I know I've got a long agenda. I'd be quick, but uh, uh, Jean, is there any uh, substantive difference in the layout uh, or uh, how, how it's placed them? It will the be exactly the same this year. We came up with a new plan two years ago. It's worked well. The police department's happy. The fire department's happy. We're happy. Then I'm happy. Then we would happy. like the spot to be a little bigger, <laughs> but we can't seem to find more land there. So no, we have to we'll buy live with what we that. have. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, he's going to get us in trouble. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item 3C, consider approval of resolution 2017-63, authorizing a transfer of funds in the amount of 40000 from Geneva Cultural Arts Commission to Geneva Foundation for the Arts. So moved. Motion by Alderman Cummings. Second, second by Alderman Maladra. Any comments or questions? I know Alderman Vitang is here. I have Alderman Cummings. 100% um, of the funds that are being moved over are uh, funds raised through charity. Right? We're not moving taxpayer dollars into a C3, right? That is, that is correct. That is correct. Thank you. That was that was it. They were raised from uh, sponsorship. If you're gonna start, you gotta come up to the mic. So every, sorry, but that's the rules. <laughs> you're okay with a yes. Once you went beyond that, <laughs> you come forward. Uh, Tim Vitang, 112 Ridge Lane. I'm chair of the Geneva Cultural Arts Commission. Um, yes, the money the money that's being transferred was raised through uh, fundraisers. Uh, eat your art out and then um, funds from sponsorship and so on of our various events. There are no tax dollars being used. And it's in keeping with the ordinance, which is uh, that we're asked to work on developing a plan and a, um, uh, moving forward with a cultural arts center at some point in the future. So this is one of the early steps of that. Thank you. It's exciting. Any other questions for oh, Alderman Kilberg before? Ms. Could. Uh, could either you or someone on staff explain how the 501c3 filings with the federal government will be handled? So in other words, who within your organization is going to do the processing of that on an annual basis 
or is that going to be the responsibility of the city? It's, it's, no. it's completely separate from the city. The, the foundation is its own 501c3. Right. They have their own board that is completely separate, so it's not even related to cultural arts. Understood. So we have, we have no... Okay, I'm just wondering, though, as far as that piece of it, because with organizations, what happens is, is uh, the federal government takes 501c3 filings very seriously, yes. and if there's a lapse or if they're not filed, there can be substantial fines that can be levied. I'm just wondering, uh, in, with a volunteer organization, you fall into the trap that sometimes p faces change, and then all of a sudden you have exposure that you don't realize as new officers or new people take over the organization. Uh, how do you see that being handled? Uh, um. Well, um, we made sure that the treasurer that's on the foundation has a financial background, specifically. She was a, a CPA and had her own accounting practice in St. Charles. And so she handles that. Um, and then our attorney makes sure, as, okay. as the registered agent, that um, we, we stay in compliance with the IRS regulations. With some of these smaller foundations in Geneva, you might, as a suggestion, you might want to visit with the Fox Valley Foundation, who administers a lot of these and uh, can do a lot of promotions and help you with your fundraising efforts. I know that the Geneva Academic Foundation, the Geneva Community Chess, uh, are both parts of are, are parts of the uh, Fox Valley Foundation, who has the administrative staff and the resources to do these types of things, and actually they can can help you with your fundraising. Uh, again, I'm not here to promote them, but they've done a lot of good work in the Fox Valley, and uh, especially as it relates to the the legal piece, I think that there might be some benefits there worth looking into. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous again. Item 3D, consider approval of ordinance number 2017-16, amending Title VI, Chapter 2, related to miscellaneous offices, marijuana possession, and drug paraphernalia possession. We'll let you take a little speech. Okay. <laughs> you um, can start it. Back in, I believe. Oh, wait. So I need a motion. Thank you. I'm sorry. I need a motion first. I apologize. So Motion by Cummings, second by Ru Alderman Ruby. Sorry, I apologize for Not that. Problem. Um, back in July, the state downgraded possession of marijuana basically to a civil offense. Um, it was brand new. They actually just created that offense and called it a civil offense. It never existed before, and they set the fine at $120. The way they wrote the state law, it was worded very much to make local municipalities believe they couldn't charge more than $120. Unbeknownst to us at the time, that wasn't the case, and local municipalities were fighting that. They needed an exemption written into the law in order for them to back it. They got that exemption. We passed our ordinance, capping it at 120, and then found out that we were completely exempt. Local ordinances can actually go up to 500. So in a little bit of an oddity, a lot of times when you charge somebody, the state law is the harshest charge um, that has the most teeth to it. You have to go to court, you can get supervision, it stays on your record all that type of thing. Well, they took marijuana away from that. They made it a civil charge, so it's almost like an ordinance ticket to begin with. So we don't really have anything in the interim that has a little bit of teeth to it to charge people, young people who are getting into marijuana and stuff like that. Um, so our ordinance was almost perfectly matching the state law, and there was no reason to basically get an ordinance. Um, so this increase would allow us to actually have an ordinance that has some teeth to it with a little bit of a higher fine Another thing we found out is there's a lot of banter right now as to whether or not you could even tell a parent that their 16-year-old was stopped by a police officer, found to be in possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia, and received this civil violation. Um, so with this, at least, raising the fine a little bit, I would think a 16-year-old would have a very difficult time coming up with $300, so they may have to let mom and dad know that they had some contact with the police and they have this fine to pay, and the parents could find out about it that way. So. We think, we think this serves a very needed purpose within the community for people who are in possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia. Any Alderman Cummings? Compared to other civil law fines, how does this lay into the This is the hierarchy. first civil law violation that the state has ever put in place. The fine can go up to $500 for a local ordinance, which many municipalities have. We were kind of behind the eight ball and having a marijuana ordinance. So there's a lot of places that have a $500 fine. When I sat down with the chief and started talking to him about it, he said, why don't we just split the middle? 
ours is at 120, 500 is the top, 300 sounds like a, a more reasonable fine. Alderman Radecki. Uh, what are the other communities? Uh, do you know what the fine is in St. Charles and Batavia? And up I believe St. Charles is 500. I, I haven't talked to Batavia yet. But they had theirs for a long, I mean, they're home rule, so they've had a lot of these ordinances that we really haven't had for a long time. Right. I, I guess I'm just uh, looking at um, putting something other than, hey, split, you know, 120 is not enough, 500, you know, there's, I'm looking for some science or some more math behind why 300 is the best number other than, it's, it's somewhere in the middle, and I do appreciate what you guys are doing. I get the logic behind it, but you know, I'm not so sure if, if you know, if 500 isn't the correct number for the fine. Um, you know, if you, if as you say, you want to make this somewhat of a deterrent and and uh, put some teeth into it, uh, why don't we really put teeth into it? So, um, I, I think it's a good topic for maybe some further discussion as to what the amount is, rather than just 300. So, thank you very much, though. Mayor. Alderman McGowan, then. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, actually, I called the city of Batavia today because I couldn't find anything on their website. St. Charles does have it on their website that they charge $500. Charge isn't the right word. But um, <laughs> Batavia um, Police Department said that um, the fine is $100. I think if it's not paid within 10 days, it goes up to $200. Okay. So I like the $300 amount. I think it's a good medium. Um, I'm in favor personally of decriminalizing um, marijuana if the state goes ahead and does that. But I agree there should be some um, enforcement of, of the existing law right now. And I think $300 is a is a good number to uh, to deter you know kids, especially for for you know we're dealing with Geneva. This isn't. Um, I'm just going to stick with that. This is Geneva, so there's a lot of families here. There's a lot of kids, and this helps. I think this helps parents um, keep their kids um, uh, on the right path and saying no to drugs. And even if they did decriminalize it, there would still be some type of age gap. We don't know where it would be. I mean, cigarettes are 18, alcohol is 21. So we would still have to have some kind of enforcement arm for kids that are underage to be in possession or consuming marijuana. Let me ask you another question, if I may. Um, I. I am totally drug free, so I'm really, I don't know about this, but my, I, I need to because my kids are getting that age. Um, what if you find a kid with like, kind of like e-cigarette paraphernalia and you, you say, oh, that's drug paraphernalia. And they say, no, it's just for e-cigarettes. Like, how do you handle that? So they didn't address that. There was nothing <laughs> when e-cigarettes came out. They were kind of a, a loophole, so to speak, in the law. So finally, Illinois said, we're just going to treat it exactly like tobacco. So anything that's e-cigarette or anything like that, that you can prove that the substance in there is tobacco based, it would fall under the cigarette laws. Now they do have the capsules which are interchangeable that can have the marijuana, you know, particles in it and stuff like that, that they can smoke v very easily. Um, so that would fall based on, you know, the, the level of THC and all that in there under the marijuana laws then. So you have to do some type of testing. We have a little drug kit that we can actually test it when we get back to the police department, take a little piece of it, throw it in this little kit, and it'll tell us whether or not there's the properties of marijuana in it. Well, um, Mayor, I believe you had. Uh, Commander, um, quick question. If a minor is caught with cigarettes, what is that O ticket fine? $75. $75. If a minor is caught with alcohol, that O ticket finds 250. 250, correct. So this council enhanced only about two years ago, I believe. Correct. And it gets sent to the state and, and their it, license gets suspended, so it would be just as if they were driving. Correct. Third, with respect to a bust of marijuana and or drug paraphernalia, is it not true that a police officer, if this goes to court, is required to then go to court as well? So those additional costs are also absorbed by the police department, which heretofore have not been covered by the fine that we're levying. And it's actually a possession charge. So all we have to walk into court is, and prove is that we found it on them. So oftentimes attorneys just wait for us to show up and say the officer's here, they're gonna say that you had it, you know, you're gonna be found guilty. So they plea out right in front of us and we turn around and walk out. It's about a 15 minute court appearance. But you get, still have to pay for the officer's time. You have to get paid for your court time. And if it's not their work shift, it's three hours. Minimum three hours, is it? Correct. So, so theoretically, 
$125 fine does not pay the costs that the city incurs. Not even close. And based on your report, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or so infractions a month. Yeah, we're at, I want to say 37 for the year. Okay. I'd have to, I, I have it here somewhere, but. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other, Alderman Radecki again? Well, to the mayor's point, and I did pick up on that when I read it in the packet, that we weren't even covering our, I mean, yeah. again, to the point of the, the amount of the fine, if we are looking to at least break even on this and, and perhaps use it as a deterrent, you know, I still think that it's valid and I'd like to hear from any other alderman if they have any opinion. I mean, it's not a make or break thing, but you know, here we sit, this is the time to probably consider it, whether 500 is the right number, 400, but you know, it seems to me that you know, 120 certainly wasn't. If 300 gets us closer to covering uh, our time into it, then I think that you know, it is worth considering um, looking at um, an increased fine because that is available to us. You know, we've increased a lot of other fines lately. <laughs> we've increased a lot of other um, application fees. We've increased our, uh, uh, an item coming up here about uh, tickets, you know, what we've done. So, you know, this is an opportunity for us. It's on the rise. There's 37, you know, ordinance violations have been issued so far. And my guess is it's going to be in the hundreds and hundreds. So, um, you know, if we really do believe this is a deterrent, then perhaps now would be the time to consider um, perhaps a stiffer fine rather than 300, uh, given that this is probably only going to continue to take up more and more of our time. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to be overly punitive, but I'm looking to be what I think might be reasonable, and I don't know that $300 is reasonable. Um, and and uh, being a parent of multiple children, um, it would be okay with me if the fine was 500 early on. You know, that they would have to come to me, that it would have some bite. It would have a little bit something more to it than, um, you know, I think some of our ordinance violations, you know, kids, you know, they pay it off, they, they walk off, and there's nothing to it. So anyway, I still think it's a, I, I think we need to give some consideration if we're here sitting right now to give uh, an increase with the fine. We've increased a lot of other things um, for a lot of other reasons, too. So thank you. Alderman Cummings. What percentage of the O tickets that are written end up? Uh, fighting it in court. I, I'd be giving you a wild guess. I really would. I mean, uh, if it's a hundred percent, then three hundred dollars doesn't cover the costs. If it's ten percent, um, three hundred dollars covers the costs. Well, and if we're going to if we're going to so get that's, into that's the thing. Sure. If so we're going to get into discussion of well, this is more in response to the you know let's go to five hundred um, before knowing who goes to court and what our costs. are are sure. not what our costs would be if it went to court, but what they are from past history. Um, uh, Three hundred sounds fine to me. It would go beyond um, just the court costs. Just so you know, I mean, it takes two officers. Anytime that we have the suspicion of somebody being intoxicated, it's mandatory that two officers are present on the scene at the site of the arrest to deal with that situation. Then there's also the processing, getting the ticket written, getting the person home if they are under the influence because they obviously can't drive. So we're waiting for transportation or bringing them home. Then there's a whole nother process that, that goes on at the police department of filling out paperwork and document everything and stuff like that. So, I mean, I would say each one of these is about a two hour process just in, in time to get these charged in the first place. And court, court costs would be separate to that. Alderman Bruno. Thank you. Uh, based on your description and some emails that uh, uh, have been going around, it does. I, I have the sense that $300 probably is pretty close to cost recovery for the city. Um, my guess is we could revisit this, but by the time we revisit this, it yeah. may be legalized anyway. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with $300. Alderman Kilberg. Uh, microphone, please. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, just some clarity. It, as it relates to driving uh, uh, under the influence of marijuana, it's treated the same way as if uh, you were under the influence of alcohol then? It is, and it, they actually made it a lot more like that. So it used to be all we had to prove is that you were under any amount um, okay. of marijuana. Now they actually make you get a blood test um, for the actual okay. milliliters of blood. Okay, if it's suspected. Yep. 
How many uh, marijuana arrests uh, are related to uh, a vehicular stop? Uh, I, I most of them? I believe we're at three this year. Okay, so really it's a small percentage that involves small driving. It's okay. a very small percentage related to Compared marijuana. to alcohol where Absolutely. most of those are related to driving. Yes. Okay, thank you. But this would still allow us to charge those people if they had it in possession during that type of stop. Good, thank you. Anyone? Alderman Berghardt. We've talked a lot about minors and young people here. Is that who makes up the vast majority of these? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say over 50%, but you still get a certain amount of adults that, that have, an, you know, over the age of 18 or over the age of 21 that have small amounts on them and stuff like that that would be subject to being charged because there is no age limit right now, the, you know, the way the state laws are and the way it's regulated. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Alderman Ruby. I guess um, to support Alderman Rudecki's argument, I, I feel kind of like, um, you know, this is against the law. It's a clear violation. And if we can charge up to $500, what are the arguments to charge less than that? It seems like there are a lot of costs. There, there are. I mean, you're never going to recoup all the costs that are, that are involved in the entire process. And we all kind of thought that if we had kids and if they were charged with something like that based on where the general trend for marijuana is, I think $300 really has enough bite to it. If it's a younger kid, they're going to have to go to their parents for that money, and then they can kind of decide the type of child that they want. If they want to handle that aggressively and make sure that that's not the path that their child goes on, which is ultimately where it lies, we're, we're never going to be able to regulate their behavior if the parents don't support it. So if the parents write a $300 check or a $500 check and say, here, your ordinance is taken care of and they're fine with it, there's not much that we can do about it. But for some of those kids that are just experimenting or are good kids, athletes have other things going on where their parents can kind of hold them accountable and say, no, you're not going to do that, and here's the things I'm going to take away and stuff like that. We thought 300 was very reasonable in terms of a, a fine. Okay. I, I, you're okay? Alderman Swanson. It's been mentioned that the uh, the fee for underage drinking was increased to 250. We're increasing. We're changing this to 300. Is there any rhyme or reason to that? Are the are the costs different involved with uh, underage drinking? No, they're probably very similar. Okay. So so we could say 250 is an appropriate we could response as well, sure. as opposed to 500. Sure. Thank you. I think the rationale was that alcohol is legal at a certain age. Marijuana was never legal. So. But illegal for minors. Right, right. Anyone else? You know, I think on this one, Stephanie, if we could, we'll take a roll call vote, please. Yeah, we'll oh, oh, okay. Uh, Hold like a microphone, please. Microphone, please. Um, I'd like to propose a friendly amendment to raise the, uh, or a, um, an amendment uh, to raise the uh, fine uh, to five hundred dollars as opposed to three hundred. I need a second for that to go forward. I have an, for an, a um, motion and a second. Uh, Alderman Radecki made the motion. Alderman Ruby made the second. Now it's open to discussion. Is that mm -hmm. correct? I just want to make sure that so we can discuss that amendment right now. It's just on the amendment. Any comments, questions? Alderman Cummings. Uh, the, the question was asked, why not make it 500? Um, and I, I think we could apply that to a lot of things. Why not? Uh, I mean, reductio ad absurdum, why not give the death penalty to running a red light or something? So at some point, you try to have the, the punishment, the repercussion match uh, what's going on. And uh, I think $300 seems fair. Uh, behind my feeling, police officers saying the same thing. They've talked about it. They've discussed it. Could we go to 500? Yeah, if the state said 5,000, could we go to 5,000? At some point, you think, well, this does sort of become absurd for what they've done. And so I think that needs to be looked at. Um, what is a reasonable but not punitive response to somebody breaking uh, what is now uh, a law? Punitive. Thank you. Any other? Alderman McGowan? Thank you. We're on the motion now only. Okay. I just want to make sure we're on we're on the motion for it to raise it the to five hundred dollars. The amendment. The amendment for five hundred dollars. <throat> okay. Um if I get off track, just stop. No, it's okay. I just want to make because we do go to call. No. Because because Illinois 
is one of the states that's becoming more accepting of marijuana use. Um, I think it would be, it wouldn't follow along with that for us to, you know, change this to the 500 to the maximum. Um, and also, I do think it would make sense to have the alcohol and the marijuana fine be the same amount. Would you, does the police department ever discuss that or have? Yeah, I would disagree with that. Okay, can you, can you kind of explain why? So the alcohol fine was if, if somebody over the age of 21 is in possession of alcohol, it's completely legal. So it's considered a status offense. So if, if I were to uh, have a 18 year old who is drinking and bring them down to the police station, I can't lock them up in a, in a local municipal jail or anything like that. They're put in a separate room. They're watched just viewing, you know, they can't be locked in the room or, you know, secured to any structure or anything like that. They're not in that type of arrest mode. They're under arrest, but their type of custody is different. Marijuana is illegal across the board. So this is, is more illegal per se. It's not legal for anybody to possess it. So this is kind of a step up. It's also, alcohol doesn't really have a gateway drug connotation to it, where marijuana, there are studies that show that it's kind of a gateway drug to other things and stuff like that. So in our eyes, the way we enforce it and how we look at things, it's, it's a little bit of a step up than just a 18, 17, 16 year old having a beer. Okay, well, thank you for clarifying that. I wasn't sure if they should, if it would make sense to have the fines the same, but I understand. I, I see yeah, the reasoning on both sides. Yeah. I'm just, I mean, I obviously have a very biased view of it. Right. You know, no, um, I think you have a, a good perspective from obviously what you do for a living. But um, yeah, I just think that 500 is too extreme. I mean, um, if you're saying that 50% of the people caught with marijuana are, are kids, um, you know, I think $300 is a suitable fine. Uh, that's just how I feel. Anyone else with any comment? I, Commander, I just, I just have to clarify something in my mind. Um, so, if if you do have um, someone, if you do um, do give an ordinance ticket for this, it sounds like the officer spends almost two to three hours. Is that correct? Just the processing of it, depending on how cumbersome the case is, yes. To just the, the, of the, of, at the event of, of actually finding the person with that drug, you're, you're saying it's two to three hours? On, on the scene, it could be 45 minutes to an hour, but then it's probably another 45 minutes to an hour worth of paperwork, if not more. You know, you have to put things into evidence, and then there's a whole evidence sheet you have to fill out. You have to write the actual report. Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes on. There's about three hours in e there before you go to court. Yep. So I am then questioning if we're recovering our costs at, at 300, if you've got three hours. You've got two officers at the scene. Just on the scene. Yes. Just on the scene. Then you have another one processing the paperwork. That's correct. And, and probably having to deal with a, a parent or an adult, which, which is probably another couple of hours. Yes. Now, I'm wondering if we're recovering our costs at that point. That's just my comment. So Alderman Maladra. I'm sorry. I thought everybody was done. That's, That's why. Right. I just had a question. Okay. It just came to mind now. Is there any... Is it difficult to uh, identify a number of offenses? It's like we could go $300 for a first offense, 500 for every offense thereafter. That's that's above my knowledge of how ordinances work. I'm not sure right. if we just check if we can legally do that. Okay. Never mind. Oh, that's that's a fair question. I'm I'm I'm, I'm not going to knock any questions. So, any other, Alderman Ruby? And uh, just uh, clarification, um, Mayor Burns, you pointed out. If the officer has to appear in court and it's on a day they're not working, it's a minimum of three hours that that officer is being paid just to show up in court? Is that, that correct. correct? Pursuant okay. to the collective bargaining agreement, if it is not on their regular work schedule, they are guaranteed three hours minimum. Sure. Okay. So I, I think that's another So for your highest paid police officer, that's roughly $150. Okay. And also, yeah, if St. Charles is charging the 500 I... They're, somebody is potentially, um, you know, saving two hundred dollars, <laughs> depending on where they are when they get <laughs> caught. So, I would be in favor of, you know, the Tri Cities all being the same amount. Sure. Alderman Swanson, I believe. Uh, my opinion on this is that we're anticipating that the uh, laws are going to change on this matter, 
I haven't heard anything. So, so it, well, I, I think the trend, the, the trend seems to be that way, it, and it, it seems like we're uh, we're overkilling the monster to uh, raise the fee as high as we can, and then a couple years or who knows when we're going to eliminate it if and when it is uh, legalized. Uh, so, that, and I assume at that point we would change the law to be underage or below whatever the right. We would probably required. just add an age to the existing ordinance. So, whatever so the state came up with for the age. With, the, with that in mind, I think the 300 is a, is a reasonable compromise as opposed to going to the maximum. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Um, St Stephanie, if we could go to a roll call vote for this. So this is on the amendment. On the amendment to raise the fine from 300 to 500. Correct. Bruno? Nay. Tara? Nay. Sorry. Cummings? Nay. Ruby? Aye. Kilberg? Nay. Maladra? Nay. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Nay. Radecki? Aye. Swanson? Nay. Motion fails. May, motion fails three on to seven. seven to three. Right. Okay. I, and we are now back to the main um, motion that was on the floor for $300. Um, any comments or questions now on that? I'd call a question. Uh, question's been called. Um, can we take a roll call on that also, please? Bruno? Aye. Burghardt? Nay. Cummings? Uh, nay. Ruby? I'm sorry, I need clarification. I thought we, we were. We're now voting on the original motion. We're now motion. voting on the original motion, which would be $300. 300. Okay. Okay. So, aye. Kilberg? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Radecki? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Motion passes eight, eight to, to two. two is what I have. That is okay, correct. Thank you. Oh, so much for the unanimous streak. But. <laughs> thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you, Commander. Um, item 3E, consider approval of Ordinance 2017-17, amending Title Seven, Chapter 4, Special Parking Privilege Spaces. I need a motion, please. Motion by Alderman Kilberg. Second. Second by Alderman Cummings. Uh, any questions, comments? Um, Alderman Radecki. Yeah, I know we've had some discussion about this in the past that I thought one of the items we said if we were going to do this that we would talk to the surrounding businesses before we made any changes. Um, do we know has that been done? No, at this point we were monitoring both the lots because there was also a debate over whether it would be the upper lot or the lower lot. So the idea is that if this is to go into effect, before it goes into effect, we would make that notification. That's why there's a delayed effective date. So and I will tell you from, from monitoring, the lower lot is not filled in the morning, which leads me to believe it's less employees and more lunchtime crowds because it is full during the lunchtime, relatively empty in the morning, relatively empty in the late afternoon, whereas the upper lot is full from about 7.15 on. The answer is no. I, I, that's what I said. I said no at this you. point, but if they, we were to go this direction, that is why there's a delayed effective date. So you would, you would notify them after? Let them know in advance that this would be happening and give them alternatives as to where they could park. But, but I mean, wouldn't it, I mean, we have, I think one of the things we're roundly criticized for with a lot of developmental issues is that people don't know about this before it happens. We vote on it, we take a vote, it happens, um, and then Folks come in here and say we were never notified, we never got any input. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, we should provide parking for our employees. I am an absolute supporter of that, but I'm also a, a supporter of uh, being sure that people uh, are notified before we make changes to give them an opportunity to give input rather than after the fact. I think that's something we receive a lot of cri criticism for. So, thank you. And if, if I may, um, one of the the conundrums we get into is if we go and notify businesses and then we come to the council and they don't want to do it, it, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. So I understand exactly where you're coming from, but without having clear direction, what direction we're going in, it's hard for staff to know who to notify and when. Alderman Maladra. But in this case, you know it's one of the two lots, right? The upper lot and the lower. No, I didn't know whether council would agree to any of that. We were directed that we could look into the issue and then bring it back to the council.
Alderman Burghardt. So who do we think parks in the upper lot? Is that employees, uh, like downtown employees I, I think that you park have, there for the yeah. day, probably? I think you have probably some people for maybe at Geneva Cleaners, um, maybe some library folks, even though they're technically supposed to be parking elsewhere, um, uh, across the way, some of the businesses that are on State Street. But again, I will tell you, as I drive in at about 715, that lot is predominantly full, and it's not with City Hall folks, but there are City Hall folks who currently park there as well. Mm -hmm. So by designating one lot will we'll reduce the number of cars in the upper lot to the lower lot that's usually less crowded. And Not to say that it doesn't fill up, they both fill up at certain and times. And the lower lot is more popular for like the lunch crowd Lunch crowd, maybe? probably because that's the only spaces there because the upper lot right. is full. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and again, I, just for clarification, the city currently rents. We lease the upper lot for public parking and we own the lower lot. Any other comment? Alderman McGowan. Um, I just wanted to point out that a lot of times when there's a business such as a restaurant with that's located in a really busy area and there may not be a lot of parking, they'll put on their website like where to park and give specific, you know, so when people are going online and checking out the menu and the hours, they can kind of get into the habit of looking, okay, well, where, where can I park, you know, so that the they can be given options. I mean, there may be a place a block north of Route 38 that has lots of parking spaces that people just don't know of. So that's just an option that businesses have. It's, you know, just want to mention that. Alderman Burkhardt again, unless anybody else. No. Okay. Go. I, I, I want to agree with Alderman Radecki. I, I guess I'd like to see this delayed by a week or two so that we could uh, notify the businesses in the area uh, to let them know uh, what lots we're talking about and if they want to come and, and uh, have their say, uh, then we can listen and we'll have probably a tougher decision to make then, but I would like to uh, involve them in the process or at least let them know that this is under debate. So I am also in support of city employees having parking. I just, um, you know, we've waited this long, maybe another week or two might be uh, worth it to, to do it the right way. So, thanks. So, do we I, I guess is that an amendment or I'm not sure. Uh, table. Uh, hmm? I moved the table was for, uh, uh, to provide the uh, staff with sufficient time to uh, solicit businesses within, uh, within the immediate surrounding area of a potential change and to uh, gather feedback. We need a date certain. I need a date certain, yes. Thank you, Stephanie. I need a second on that second by Alderman Cummings that is not a an item to be discussed so uh, Stephanie if we could just have a roll call on that sure please. Bruno aye Burkhart aye Cummings aye Ruby aye Hilberg? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Radecki? Aye. Swanson? Aye. That is unanimous. So we will move that to um, the agenda on um, Thank you. June 26th. Stephanie, if you could please make a note of that for, for you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, item 3F, consider or approval of ordinance number 2017-18, amending title 7, chapter 3, parking find is and I think that's what the commander was standing for he thought that last one was going to go quicker <laughs> I did but that's all right hello everyone me first okay um, I guess I do need a motion I'm sorry I need a motion for this motion by Cummings second by Swanson go ahead so this is an attempt for government to be more responsive and flexible um, to something that just doesn't work um, I came before the council last June um, with an update to a years old um, parking fine structure um, and it had dates that unbeknownst to me didn't work for the software that we had at the time um, and we kind of put a band-aid on that and got a little bit of a fix going for that. It capped out um, towards the maximum that a lot of other communities, maybe one other community had, um, but we were consistent on, on the low end. Um, and then I got 
phone call after phone call after phone call um, that we had raised it whatever percentage and the fine was too high um, and how am I going to pay for this and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so it was wildly unpopular for people that they were getting a $150 fine for parking when they could go speed and endanger somebody on the roadway and it was the same, the same cost. Um, so I spoke with some of the, the record specialists and they said, yes, this is very cumbersome. It doesn't work with our software system. The dates are too close the way that they're spaced. We can't get notification out. We can't get letters out. And before people even know it, within a month, it's $100 and 45 days, it's $150. Um, so I kind of went back to the drawing board, got a lot more people involved and tried to put together a, a structure that works a little bit on, more on both ends. Um, the dates are a little bit longer for our record specialist to be able to process the tickets that are coming in, get notification out to people, things of that nature. And I took away that last top tier that made it $150 at the top that would cap out at 100. Um, and this is just for the prohibited or improper parking. It didn't touch on the, the time overtime parking. And if I just make, make one clarification, when we talk software, we're not talking about the New World software that was implemented with the city in 2012. We're talking about the ticketing software. Yes, so we have a completely separate parking ticket software that was DOS-based back when Windows came to fruition. Um, <laughs> back when Windows came to fruition, um, the, the gentleman who uh, implemented the software, I guess he came to the police department and literally hand put it together. Um, I think he lives in DeKalb or something like that um, and did a great job at the time because it only increased one time and then off it went. Um, it worked with the system that we had for notifying um, people by sending out the letters and everything like that and everything was good to go. Uh, that system is, is very, very outdated and didn't allow for any sort of a tier system. Luckily, he is still alive. He's still in the software business. He was able to get a patch together um, and he was able to get us the different tiers that we need. Um, but it doesn't notify and it doesn't talk with the system that writes the letters in a timely manner. So a lot of that has to and will be need to be done by hand. So the additional days um, for them to increase would really help our staff out a lot. Uh, Alderman Bruno. If I could speak to that piece of software. I know that's come up before and, uh, and it causes some other problems, one of which is um, this is already out in the public, so I'll say it again. The uh, uh, everything's just reset January first. Um, you know, so if your third offense disappears, um, I would like to uh, have an effort to uh, replace that uh, that software, or if we can incorporate it into some type of that would be a capital need, and we'd have to take that about up during year. the budget. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Commander. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Um, now we're down to item 3G, consider approval of resolution number 2017-49, authorizing a three-year extension of the management agreement with Baum Property Management and Mutz Landscape Inc. for Fisher's Farm SSA 16. Motion by Kilberg. Second. Second by Bruno. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous again. Um, item 3H, consider approval of resolution number 2017-50, declaring fire department vehicle number 201 as surplus property. Need a motion. Motion by Swanson, second by Ruby. Any comments, questions? I know the fire chief is here just in case we have any, but I don't see any. Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, item 3I, consider approval of resolution number 2017-51, authorizing execution of identification sign easement agreement with Geneva Park District. So moved. Motion by Bruno. Second. Second by Berghart. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3J, 
Um, consider staff request for direction on a, on a securing construction management services for water, wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Um, I don't believe there's any vote on this tonight. This is just, I think, giving you guys some feedback. We have, it's still, it's still going. Yep, I'm watching it. Uh, Mr. Van Geskem is here and Mr. Babicum to answer questions, comments. I know there were some with this. Any comments or questions? I, I guess a little background maybe. I mean, but what we are is we want to know if we want to go out for some type or use the company who did all the drawings. It's my summation of reading that. That's a, that's a pretty concise okay. summation. <laughs> Tried to be. We, I brought this up during a strategic planning session that we had back in November of 2016 for the budget process. And trying to get some consensus or direction from the city council then as to how best forward to complete this project, this project that was started in 2013. Uh, at the time, uh, the, there were several aldermen that asked for historical analysis of basically how did we get from there to here, which we included, at the, I believe that's in your third and fourth paragraphs of the city council report you have in front of you tonight. Basically in 2013, the city of Geneva elected to do an RFQ or request for qualifications hire an engineering firm to meet the upcoming uh, unfunded mandate from the IEPA regarding phosphorus removal at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, as a result of that RFQ process, several candidates were narrowed down, proposal was solicited from them and the committee elected and brought forth to the city council the recommendation for CDM Smith to move forward with the concept review, uh, which they then completed uh, the City Council reviewed that concept approval and gave uh, CDM Smith authorization to begin the design work and specifications um, in 20, uh, 2015. Uh, that work has been ongoing and now we have this. This is the specification book for the wastewater treatment plant. This is what over a thousand hours of staff time and several hundred thousand dollars worth of engineering gets the citizens of Geneva. Nothing has been built yet. Nothing has been <laughs> other than taking out a loan with the IEPA. And securing uh, a significant amount of staff time. This is what you end up with. The plans alone are over 50 pages, full size drawings. 1,000 pages of specifications, 100? 120. He counted them. I asked him to count them. <laughs> so that's what Bob that did this afternoon. Um, so here we are. Before, uh, with the approval of the IEPA loan last Monday, we are now getting into the process of putting this project out to bid. It's going to be out to bid for six to eight weeks, thereabouts. So we have some time now to make a decision as how we're going to handle the phase three construction engineering. This project is slated for 562 days. That translates into roughly 18 months of work that will be ongoing while the wastewater treatment plant is fully functioning and remaining compliant with all IEPA standards. So this is going to be one of the most intense projects that the city council or that the city has ever undertaken. Uh, while the wastewater, while the water treatment plant, forgive me, was more expensive, uh, we, the city had the advantage of having the other water treatment plants online. So we didn't have to do the balancing act of the new construction, the demolition, the rehabilitation of the existing structures, as well as dealing with the ongoing treatment requirements as mandated by the IEPA. And rather than bringing forth a recommendation um, to continue the process with CDM Smith, Basically, myself and Bob wanted to take this opportunity with you all to get a comfort level before we move on uh, to ensure that whatever measures we do implement and whatever road we go down for the phase three engineering, that we're moving forward without any hiccups and last minute delays and anything that can potentially delay the project. Um, Alderman Kilberg. My experience is I think CDM Smith has done the city a, um, a certainly an acceptable job to this point in the process and, uh, and certainly deserves a lot of consideration uh, for the uh, 
construction management services piece. I guess my question is, if we reach a decision tonight and we want to go with CDM Smith, what's the assurances that we're going to be working toward the 8% rather than the 10% because we're talking about a quarter of a million dollars? In other words, the thing is, if they know, it, I guess, if we essentially reduce the field to just one company uh, and we don't have a final figure on what that percentage is going to be, we're talking about a quarter of a million dollars here. Uh, how, how do we prevent uh, this from being 10% rather than 8%? Myself, Bob, and Dan Dobnik, the wastewater treatment plant manager. Excuse me, 8% rather than 10%. Is that what I said? That's <laughs> right. with you. Okay. Um, you were tracking with me. We, we have been, uh, for lack of a better word, beating CDM Smith over the head for the last six months, uh, even doing the phase two design. Okay. Questioning how they're spending their staff time, what they're reviewing their time, having our staff, whenever possible or practical, do the grunt work for them to keep those costs down. And right now we're on track of bringing the phase two under, under budget and under their time limit. And their contract that whoever ends up with this contract, be it CDM Smith or someone else, is basically on a not to exceed amount of contract with a blanket amount of hours dedicated for staff time. So if they use the entire staff time, they get paid X. If they don't because we've been able to do those tasks or we've been able to work around spending those hours, the contract comes in under. And at that point in time, basically, I, I would be very confident in both um, mine and staffs as well as the city administrators track record of making sure that all our contractors really come in I, I don't want to trip on something here with the next item coming up but for the most part coming in on time and on budget every time I understand that and I'm not questioning your competency and that, that you're going to negotiate in the city's best interest I'm just saying though if you're a single bidder uh, it does put you in somewhat of a favorable position if you know coming into this process that uh, that the council is already more or less giving you the directive that we want to go with them. I mean, I, I think it makes it more difficult for you to negotiate. But again, you know, uh, they've got, we have 12 month history with them, right? More than that, 2003. Oh, 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 well, before, okay, really though on this project though, 12 months. With the right, and they've done a very capable job. Um, you know, that, that's not, we can't dispute that. And I understand that construction management, uh, construction managers can be very critical in, in a successful outcome. In other words, they can save the city money, they can prevent um, um, change orders and a lot of things that uh, can, uh, can cost the city maybe even a lot more than a quarter of a million dollars. So I'm just saying, uh, I mean, uh, I'm prepared to go ahead with this. Uh, uh, I just, uh, want to put you in the most favorable position as it relates to negotiating this because $12 million, 2% of $12 million is real money. Yes, it is. So good luck. I, uh, that's my position. One of the other significant advantages of maintaining that continuum through the process is also there's a clear line of accountability. Uh, there, uh, there were some concerns expressed during strategic planning as will this process work? Has the process been tested out? We found similar wastewater treatment plants there in the Boston area that use the same process that we are going to be sending. The city is not. CDM Smith is going to be paying our, some of our wastewater treatment plant staff a pending city administrator approval uh, to conduct a site visit. But with the same engineers that have done the process studies and the design studies and the permit reviews and the design plans doing the construction engineering, there's a clear line for the city and a certain percentage of safety for the city that if there are issues with the design or with the process, it's a one-stop shop. We know exactly who's held to be held accountable for, the, for that issue, which we're desperately trying to avoid. We Alderman Bruno. Yeah, I would uh, I'd like to recap. I think the two most compelling points in, uh, in some communications we exchanged uh, earlier today, the, uh, the continuity of having the same engineer removes one pretty substantial vulnerability. Um, 
and in something that's an 18 month uh, timeline, if we did RFPs or RFQs, um, you know, and pull two months out of that program, that's a pretty substantial ding to put us behind the eight ball. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to uh, Alderman Kilberg's concerns, and that was one of my initial uh, concerns that uh, I think the, uh, the benefits of uh, using CDM Smith outweigh the negatives. Thank you. Alderman Swanson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, what, I, what I heard you say is that if we were to choose CDM or a different uh, engineering firm, we would still structure the contract the same way, be it a, an hours-based. Uh, it would be based on a certain number of hours to perform the, the functions. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. So, so there would be potentially not a great uh, dollar impact of shopping this or, or doing something differently, which makes uh, CDM uh, a better alternative in my mind. So would yes, that sir. be a correct assumption? Yes, it would. Okay. Uh, if someone else came in with a substantially fewer hours, I think staff would question how much of a presence they're going to have on the job site. This project's going to be under construction for 18 months straight, irregardless of the weather conditions. Uh, it's also going to be going on while the Union Pacific is doing their third rail project, which uh, they'll be using the same access road at the wastewater treatment plant for about four months while the Juki builds a retaining wall. Uh, there's going to be a significant amount of dancing and scheduling with this project. Thank you. Rich. One, one last comment. There's probably at least a half a dozen projects very similar to what Geneva is undertaking here that's in process in northern Illinois here, probably more, a lot more than that. And I'm just saying we have a history here with a, in, an engineering firm with the capability to provide construction management that's a known thing. If, was, if, we, if we solicit bids, you know, are we going to – are we going to be attracting the most capable? Because I'm sure that a lot of these company schedules are probably filling up and uh, and that uh, if you don't have a job now, what's left are probably some of the inferior types of uh, uh, construction management companies that could possibly perform this uh, uh, these services for the city. Is, is that a reasonable assumption possibly? Well, I wouldn't make, want to make any disparaging comments about. No, I'm, the I'm other, not asking you to, but I'm just there, saying it's going to limit the field and the people that don't have work currently in a very high demand market right now may not provide the type of work that, uh, that Geneva would, would prefer in the end. I th think that would be a common sense argument and a logical argument to make. Okay. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say. Any other? I'm, I'm probably going to ask two questions that, that aren't probably you might not know the answer to, but I'm going to. If we go with the same company, will they probably be using the same staff? Is that a reasonable assumption to make or so that they're really familiar with the plans? The project manager and the project designer will remain the same. Okay. okay. But we will be moving to a different segment of the population from conceptual to. But, but we'll still have some continuity there Absolutely. is my question. Yeah, okay. The, the, main, the main project manager will, will remain. Right. And the design people are still available. They'll, they'll be probably looking at some of the, quite a few of the uh, shop drawings and those types of things. So. And then one other uh, question might be a little off, but since I'm chair, I can answer this. Um, do these companies ever do design build, tie, tie in with these engineering firms, like projects like this ever tie into construction companies that stop some of that finger pointing? Because that always happens in any type of a construction project, or is that new to this type of? municipal work actually it's not um, okay. during our research we we found that uh, with the help of superintendent Wright drag him into this conversation that when the Geneva generating facility was built that was done as a design build okay and that was uh, the first time such a project was ever undertaken by the city of Geneva okay so it does happen with these kind of pro okay so is that usually I guess for the future I'm asking is that usually better I'm getting off topic so it's a yes or no or does it know? I think if 
if I was, I don't know. I don't want to throw Dan under you know the what? bus, I'll but <laughs> if I, I probably, I might have approached this in that manner back in 2013 when it, when I, okay. when it was first started. So the consensus, just unless someone else has anything else to say, I'm getting the consensus that we're just happy with the, them negotiating an agreement now with the current engineering firm. Is, is anybody opposed to that, I guess, uh, Mayor, if I can ask I it that way? Yeah. I, I mean, if someone is opposed, I would say speak up now because... When the contract comes, it's going to be too late to speak up. They've made that clear to us that this is the dance and it's the final dance. So um, we're just going to be approving something. Go ahead, Dean. <laughs> A microphone, please, for this. Uh, when do you think this could be finalized? By the end of the month? Oh. It, it could be as early as the end of the month, if not the first cow in, in July. Okay, thank you. I, I'm mayor, unless I'm wrong. I'm, I'm telling you guys, I've, I've got um, full consensus to go ahead. Is what I'm hearing tonight, mm -hmm. Mayor. Do you, do you agree with that? So, sure. go to it, guys. Thank if, you, sir. If that's Thank what you, you need, is that all you need for for this topic? Yes. For that, yes. <laughs> okay. The, the rest Thank of the plan is pretty much mine. So. I mean, I'm, okay. Just. <laughs> Item 3K, which is consider approval of resolution number 2017-53, authorizing execution of contract with Pulte Construction, Inc., in the amount not to exceed $2,763,031.25 for 2017-18 Street Improvement Program. I need a motion, please. So moved. Motion by Bruno. Second. Second by Alderman Hermey. Um do you have a presentation, uh, something to say first, or you just actually questions? just one minor question? Is Pulte Construction? Pulte, sorry, you're uh, right. They uh, they are the, the same contractors we utilized for the 2016 street infrastructure project. Uh, they are three hundred thousand dollars. Their bid is three hundred thousand dollars under the engineer's estimate, as well as close to two hundred thousand dollars under the next lowest bid. Uh, they have uh, fundamentally restructured the subcontractors that will be utilized on this year's project. And uh, we have a senior representative from Plody Construction uh, who's here to answer any questions you may have. The list of streets is included within the packet. Uh, the most significant street is the reconstruction of uh, Richards and Stevens on the uh, west side of town, the northwest side of town. Uh, that is a direct result of removing and replacing a four inch water main that runs underneath Richards uh, with a modern eight inch water main, which will greatly increase the fire flows and hopefully uh, allow Chief Antonori to sleep better at night. And we're also, uh, I'm gonna drag everybody in tonight. <laughs> we're also upgrading the water mains on Stevens from North Six to Richards uh, from the existing eight inch structures to 10 inch structures uh, and larger in, in one instance uh, to increase the amount of fire flow that's available. God forbid something happens at Burgess Norton. Then we have uh, a numerous resurfacing projects scattered throughout town. Uh, we have a sidewalk reconstruction project over on Jefferson on the east side of town from 25 uh, headed north, as well as a patching program on Illinois Route 38. Uh, which is a combination of uh, routine patches that are too big for my street division staff to conduct with the equipment we have, as well as some significantly larger patches as a result of various water main breaks and valve failures and suffered by the water utility over the last six months. Okay. Alderman Malader, I know you got a microphone, please, but you had your hand up. So I have to say I was surprised to see uh, the selection of this contractor or this firm given the uh, issues we had on River Lane. So um, what I would like to hear is some explanation of how this differs from that project and how we feel we can put our faith in these guys to get it right the first time instead of great problem, compound that mistake with another mistake, compound that mistake with yet another mistake again. Well, Mark, I'd invite you to come up. <laughs> but one thing that I can point out that's substantially different from this project and from the South River Lane project is the underground contractor has completely been revamped. Um, the subcontractor they're proposing is... What about, what about the 
landscaping contractor. Well, the I landscaping mean, it seems like every one of them was an issue. Well, the I, I don't want to throw the landscaping con subcontractor under the bus because they were given a raw deal. They were given the, what? They, they were in a sense that the underground subcontractor was substantially delayed in getting their work done. And when you're doing it as an aggressive project as South River was, and South River was a headache from day one because you had extremely limited access throughout the neighborhood. You had an extremely high bedrock table. There were portions of that roadway where the bedrock was less than 18 inches below ground. We had 1937 construction, so when we had to replace the water services and the sanitary services, we had to bring those up to modern plumbing code standards, which means a 10-foot horizontal separation as opposed to the 18-inch horizontal separation that they had. And these underground subcontractors struggled, for lack of a better word, to get their work done. And every day that that slipped, the project was delayed to the point where the landscaping subcontractor who was scheduled to be in and out on, ha on Halloween finished up about two weeks ago. And we were banging the drum to get them motivated. And uh, every contract that I've ever had on a road contract has liquidated damages within it. And last year was the first year I've ever actually pulled the trigger on liquidated damages. Uh, to the extent of over $40,000 of liquidated damages. And what liquidated damages basically means is that we withhold payment permanently from the general contractor, which means Plody took the hit. The gentleman behind us took the hit for, for that work. Now, whatever arrangement they came up with with their subcontractors is between them and them. But uh, that was the only time in my career over 26 years that we've ever invoked a liquidated damages clause because of project delays. Okay, so here, here's my deal. Um, when this was all taking place, it was, it was always Plody's issue or the subcontractor's issue, but to the residents, it's Geneva's issue. I, I understand that. So for this next project, the same thing's gonna apply again. It's gonna be Geneva's issue again. Mm -hmm. This time, if we have issues, I'm not going to look at you or your subcontractors. I'll look at you and say, you, you're bagging these guys. And you're good with that. The, the recourse we have, again, is liquidated damages. And liquidated, uh, but damages, liquidated is, damages is great, but the hit to our reputation is there and it's lasting. So great, we get liquidated damages, but we still go down as the, you know, the, the, the organization that couldn't do the project, right? Well, I, I, we have a I guess I, res risk I respectfully disagree with that assessment because <laughs> the the infrastructure that we replaced under South River was from 1937. Okay, that's the same year my father was born. Yeah, um, I I understand all when, of that. When you have to basically what we did on South River is the city spent over one and a half million dollars modernizing 2,400 feet of roadway. That's an incredible reinvestment by the city into that neighborhood. And we were very blunt with those residents that this was going to be an extremely painful project. We had weekly release, releases to the residents. Unfortunately, I can tell you unequivocally that a lot of those residents didn't read those releases because I would get calls on a Friday saying, well, nobody told me what was gonna happen this week and I would literally read them the release that was taped to their front door on Tuesday. We had special alerts set up through our communications director to alert those residents with those information. We did everything humanly possible to keep that information flow out to the residents. And yeah, I, I know you took a beating. Mm -hmm. you, you survived. I did. As, and I have scars. Thank you. I have. <laughs> scars from South River. I still get calls from one or two of those residents on a weekly basis about restoration work. Mm -hmm. And there is a reason why I insisted that someone from Plody to be here tonight to give the assurances of Plody construction to the city council that what happened on South River is not gonna happen again. Because when we read those low bid announcements, um, 
I was genuinely shocked. Uh, part of me did not even expect that Pody was going to come back into town after what happened last year. And they are, and I think they're making a statement by coming back into Geneva, you know, as a recommitment to the citizens of Geneva that what happened last year, uh, they are going to do whatever needs to be done to keep that from happening again. And th this is, for lack of a better word, their chance. This is, I'm putting my head out on the chopping block here too, and I understand I'm asking the city council to take a leap of faith here by saying that my recommendation, my professional recommendation to the city council is that Plody is making a recommitment to the citizens of Geneva and that they are gonna do everything humanly possible to make sure that what happened last year does not happen again. Now, Mark, I don't wanna be putting words in your mouth, so anytime you wanna come up to the microphone, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> How do you tell that? First, last name and your position with the company, uh, Mark please. Mark Bear, I'm a senior project manager for Plody. Thank you. I wasn't involved in last year's project, but I understand the complexity of it with the rock cut and the sewer contractor was late. We've restaffed our subcontractor supply this year, and we're using Glenbrook. We have a pre-con scheduled for, I believe, June 29th. We'll start earlier. If we talk about the problems with landscaping, that snowballed from them being behind by a month and then fight the job on top of that. So that's not in our schedule and our plan. I live 10 minutes away from Geneva, so I'm close. We'll have somebody on staff here to make sure things get done correctly. But that being said, I think we have a history of getting, I've been up on 90 and 390 the last five years working for Plody or four years for Plody. So I'm not afraid to walk into a job like this and take it over, it's not a problem. All right. Thanks. Questions? Any other questions? Alderman Bruno? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Director Babica, the, uh, the, the, the aspect that we were basically sitting on top of bedrock in, in River Lane, was that the fundamental thing that pushed everything out so far? Or is it, it a major? It was a known issue when the project was specified and it was called out in the construction plans. I think unfortunately that the, the subcontractor that went to work in that area and, and, I, and again, I don't wanna make any disparaging comments here, but, but they did struggle to meet, their, meet the schedule. And with their, their delay of themselves, the original schedule called for them starting work at the end of July. Uh, they didn't start work until the end of August. Uh, that fundamentally uh, really pushed that timetable and threw it out the window. Ironically enough, the, when we were setting up this project, staff identified the major heartache for the South River project as being the Harrington, is how we can ensure that the Harrington is gonna have access, because they they're, they're fully booked for their weekends a year in advance. So we, we spend a lot of time and effort making sure that the Harrington would have access for their, their customers, their deliveries, their refuse trucks, as well as all the commercial entities and business entities and the police department to their parking lot. And that went off without a hitch. And as soon as we started tearing into the bedrock with the, with the sub, it was just uh, a series of unfortunate events that led to the delays, which led to us getting probably the four of us getting calls from residents on a fairly routine basis. Well, the, the reason I ask about the bedrock is uh, I'm looking at the topography, basically River Lane is at the bottom of the, the river valley with possibly the exception of the west end of, is that uh, Jefferson Street uh, ending at Route 25? We, we certainly wouldn't have that type of geography or uh, geology um, impacting these uh, these this road work is that fair correct because the work on Jefferson is a removal and a resurface as well as sidewalks and some minimal structure okay, adjustments so. so there's not a significant amount of excavation work so whatever Jefferson. whatever aspect that, that that bedrock played is is moot for for any of the work we're doing here thank you any other comments, questions? Alderman Ruby. I'm just curious about the, 
the bid, the fact that it was the lowest, um, if that raises any concerns, like why, maybe this is typical, I don't know, uh, but you know, are there any concerns over, over quality or workmanship? You know, is this a case of you get what you pay for? Or, you know, I'm just curious about why the bid came in so much lower, if you have any input on that. Plody, in an, in an evaluation of their bid tab for this year, uh, Plody Construction is using a lot of their internal forces. There's not that much subcontractual work going on, uh, which I'm, I'm, I would assume is some cost savings. They're doing all the concrete work for the curbs and the sidewalks using internal forces. The demolition is all internal forces. Uh, this project also has a lot of resurfacing as opposed to underground construction. And the underground construction that is there is in a fairly well-defined area where um, traffic control is going to be a lot easier because the residents are going to have more access through the area. They're, they're not basically boxed in to where they can't even get out their driveway because I just dug an eight-foot hole in the middle of the street. So there, there are a lot of advantages to the way this project is. But that is one thing that we noticed when we did the bid tabs is how much more of this work is being done through internal forces at Plody and not through subcontractors. So I would assume that that has something to do with it. Anyone else? Hearing none, seeing. If, go if, ahead. If I could, Sorry. the, the no, thought also ahead. occurred to me. Um, because this is a government maintenance project, uh, prevailing wage applies, which basically means theoretically the, the wage cost should be the same. So the only variables at play here are the material costs and the transportation costs. And I'm sure with Plody having their own asphalt plant, um, they can control those costs a lot better than a contractor that has to utilize someone else's plant to bring the material in. Any other comments? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Goes through unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are on item uh, L, 3L, consider approval of resolution 2017-54, authorizing execution of tree trimming contract in the amount of 120000 for the 2017 electric line clearing project. So Motion by Cummings. Second by Berghardt. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3M, consider approval of resolution number 2017-55, authorizing a purchase of Alltech AT41P, articulating telescoping aerial device and new Ford F. 550 chassis to replace truck number 22 in combined amount of $130,780. Need a motion? So Kilberg makes the motion. Second. Second by Alderman McGowan. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3N. Consider approval of resolution number 2017-56, declaring street division truck number 35 as surplus and used for trade-in value of 5,500 towards the item M, which means we're going to put it on that 550 chassis truck that we just voted. Um, I need a motion, please. So moved. Motion by, Berghar, uh, by Bruno, I'm sorry, second by McGowan. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. Item 3O, consider approval. We're running out of alphabet here, aren't we? <laughs> 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 consider approval of resolution 2017-57 awarding bid and contract to Stanley Consultants in an amount not to exceed 75000 for Western Avenue Substation Transformer Project Management. I need a motion. So moved. Motion by Bruno. Second. Second. Second by Berghardt. Comments or questions for on this? Um, Rich, this is a two-year project, right? This is just the first part of this. Or is, did I read that right? Or, or hell, yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't, <laughs> I thought you abandoned. <laughs> It's a 
it's a two-year project. The delivery on a transformer right now is about nine months. So the, the idea this year is to design the, the project. We have some oil containment issues. The pad may not be as big as it needs to be. Um, get a specification written for the transformer. Go out to bid and award that. Typically when you get drawings for the transformer, that's a 10% payment. We've got enough money in the budget to do that, we believe. And then construct it, place it the following year. So do labor contracts next year. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Item 3P. Consider approval of resolution number 2017-58, awarding bid and contract for annual purchase of cable. I, I need a motion. Alderman Swanson, sorry. A second? Second. Alderman Ruby. Any questions, comments? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is passed unanimously. Item 3Q, consider approval of resolution number 2017-59, awarding bid for contract for annual purchase of transformers and switch gears. Oh. Motion by Kilberg, second by Ruby. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item 3R, consider approval of resolution number 2017-60, awarding bidding contract to Wesco in the amount of $60,706.13 for 2017 cable replacement project. So Motion by Berghart. Second. Second by Bruno. Any comments, questions, concerns? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, item 3S, consider approval of resolution number 2017-61, amending the existing utility easement for Commonwealth Edison at the South First Street Overflow commuter parking lot. Any motion by Burghart? Second by Swanson. Comments, questions? Hearing none, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that. Sorry. Alderman McGowan, I apologize. Yep. Now Rich is coming back up for that one. <laughs> you don't want to touch that? <laughs> no, this, this doesn't involve hail. This is combat. It's, it's counterparts. It sounds like electrical. <laughs> Competition. Well, yeah. As part of the third rail project that's upcoming, uh, the Union Pacific and Metro are going to have to build a retaining wall along the extreme north edge of the commuter overflow parking lot, which puts their retaining wall basically right on top of a ComEd easement. There's a ComEd underground duck run that runs from uh, Route 31 through there and then eventually crosses the river. Uh, that was identified very early on in the process uh, during the utility reviews and that that uh, would have to be abandoned and relocated. ComEd initially simply said, well, we'll just move it 15 feet further to the south, life, life is good. Well, the downtown master plan calls for sometime in the future a parking deck to potentially be built at the commuter overflow lot. And if we had allowed a ComEd easement 15 feet further to the south of the existing easement, it would have precluded us from ever building that parking deck ever. So we really threw a challenge flag on that and worked with ComEd to relocate their easement to the south side of our parking lot, but still within our property. So basically what's happening is that we're doing two things tonight, or we're asking the city council to do two things tonight with this resolution. The first one is to grant ComEd a new easement on the south side of the parking lot. And then upon completion of the installation of their utilities, the existing easement on the north end of our parking lot will be abrogated. And I had to look that up too because that was a, a Radovich term. 
<laughs> basically means we're, we're, they're going to vacate that easement and abandon their utilities in place, which will allow the city to have those options should it chose so choose for additional structures or whatever it wants to build at that parking lot. We're basically keeping long-term city options for the commuter overflow lot in play while allowing ComEd to keep their utilities and found a way to get the UP to build their retaining wall. And you still have the, f you still have the floor. <laughs> a microphone, please. please. All right. No, it's okay. Um, so this, this plan is just, it's coming directly from the city. Like this is our plan. This isn't the railroad or the utility kind of saying, hey, this is what we would like. I just want to know, does this, do you understand the question? I do. Uh, ComEd designed this uh, with review by city staff as well as the UP staff to ensure that we were redu reducing or eliminating all the conflicts as much as possible and practical. And then it had full legal review by ComEd's legal department as well as the city attorney to make sure that the uh, I's were dotted and T's were crossed. But we have been intimately involved, uh, myself in the engineering section, <coughs> as well as the electric utility, uh, Jennifer Hilkeman, with finding this route that ensure that the long-term interests of the city are being met, the short-term interests of the UP are being met, as well as ComEd is being adequately protected for its future, uh, so they don't have to keep moving their utilities around. And are these just underground utilities? Like, is the utility easement for <coughs> below ground only or above ground? These lines well? will be will be run underground and eventually run uh, to the Route 31 easement or the Route 31 right away. Then they'll continue down Route 31 to roughly the uh, traffic signal at Third and Route 31, cross underneath Route 31 through an underground bore uh, to about 100 feet north of South Third Street, but well south of the railroad tracks, and then cross back under South Third Street heading west and running along the um, underneath the existing and future parking lot for the uh, commuter lots. So are you completely happy with this? Is your department completely happy with this plan? Yes, it, it works. Um, okay. Yes, we, 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 we had some rather lengthy arguments and discussions with ComEd about uh, uh, trying to encourage them to not open cut route thir uh, South Third Street during the middle of summer and potentially you know, during Swedish days or Festival of the Vine or Concourse de Elegance. And they agreed that that was a bad plan. So uh, from my point of view, it couldn't go any better than this. Uh, we're not disrupting the traffic on South Third Street. We're not disrupting the businesses on South Third Street. We're not disrupting the shopping traffic on South Third Street. And we're not losing the commuter overflow parking lot, which is a revenue generator for the city at the same time. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, uh, where this is being moved, when I was driving around, there's, there's already electric, electric utilities overhead in this area. Is, this, is it the same place that these underground utilities are going to be going or run parallel? Yes and no. There are city utilities that run through their overhead utilities. There's ComEd utilities that run through their uh, there still will be overhead lines between 3rd Street and Route 31 along the south side of the railroad tracks, but the new utilities that are being installed will be put in underground. Uh, okay, so the, so the overhead lines that are between the river and 31, oh no, it, it, yeah, those will be underground or what's overhead now will stay overhead? If I remember the map right. The, the transmission lines will be underground. ComEd will be completely away from the south side of the railroad tracks. They will be, everything will be moved south to the commuter overflow lot, and those lines will be underground. Uh, there are AT&T and Comcast lines, but I believe they're on the north side of the train tracks. 
So we should have a relatively clean aerial view with the exception of the retaining wall from the commuter lot, from the wood line to the railroad tracks. There will be, I think it's the second time I hit that tonight, there will be overhead lines from Route 31 to 3rd Street because okay. those are both ComEd lines as well as our lines uh, that are feeding, our lines are feeding the commercial entities and I believe there are some ComEd feeder circuits in there for the trains, their stuff. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? He's not throwing the challenge flag. So no, he hasn't. I, I was watching. He was nodding his head the whole time. So, and it wasn't for sleep. It was <laughs> <laughs> in agree. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Item 3T, consider approval of resolution number 2017-62 awarding bid and contract to utility dynamics in the amount of $596,739.54 for 2017 underground cable replacement project. I need a motion. Motion by Alderman McGowan. I need a second. Second. Second by Alderman Bruno. Are there any comments, questions, concerns? Hearing none, seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I finally see, since we did amend the agenda, that we are now down to item five, mm -hmm. uh, adjournment. Uh, Move to a adjourn. Motion by Bruno, seconded by? Second. Second by Alderman Swanson. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>